All right. <clears throat> we have now talked about all of the basic general topics that we're going to cover anyway in kinetics for this semester. It's now time to switch gears and begin talking about applications of kinetics, especially to biology. So we're going to spend a fair amount of time now talking about enzyme catalysis specifically. But in order to talk about enzyme catalysis, we've got to talk about what catalysis is. So for the rest of the time for Friday, today, or tomorrow, we're not going to talk about enzymes much anyway. We're going to talk mostly about the general idea of what catalysis is. So in biology, of course, catalysis is everything because enzymes are everything. And there are lots of ways to say that, and I think many people in the class already know what all those ways are. But just to pick one particularly sort of crucial thing, if you've got a metabolic pathway, and if that metabolic pathway needs to be turned off or turned on, or if the metabolic pathway needs to be switched from one product to another, for example, then how do you do that? How do you change a rate constant? How do you turn a rate constant off, right? So if the rate constant is pretty appreciable and you want to stop that, you want to be able to turn it off. How do you do that? Well, a catalysis allows you not to turn a rate constant off, but it allows you to turn it on, which means that if you're using a reaction that's already got a slow rate constant, so it's basically off, then putting in the catalysis turns it on. You can't turn it off, but you can turn it on. And if you're using all reactions that are normally slow, then that means that you can control the reaction by turning things on. You basically have switches now, effectors, that allow you to turn pathways on and off, or switch their output, switch their behavior. OK, so what's catalysis? In general, a, cat a catalyst is something that speeds up a reaction but isn't actually a reactant or product itself. So let's suppose I have this simplest of all possible reactions, A goes to B with a rate constant K. Now I put in the catalyst C, but it appears on both sides, notice. It isn't consumed or produced by the chemical reaction, or maybe you could say it's both consumed and produced, but the net result is that it appears on both sides of the reaction and with the same, same stoichiometric coefficient on both sides, right? If it was 2C over here, it would still have to be 2C over there. And with the C present, then this rate constant is different and much faster. That's the effect of a catalyst. Let me say that the whole field of catalysis has many different, it's very wide and very varied. There's all kinds of different types of catalysis. Some of them are subtle and hard to recognize. Uh, we won't deal with all of that. We won't even deal with a fraction of that, but we will at least deal with the basics. Now, because the catalyst is neither created nor destroyed in the chemical reaction, even though it appears on both sides here, it's not created or destroyed, it's not non-net anyway, created or destroyed. That means that a, cat a catalyst, though it speeds up the rate constant, doesn't change the thermodynamics. You can see that in one way. Here's one way. Here's our reaction with the catalyst present. The Q for that reaction, the reaction quotient, the thing that goes into the delta G, the thing that at equilibrium would be the equilibrium constant, using the normal rules would be the activity for B on the product side, the activity for C on the product side, activity for A and activity for C on the reactant side. And you can see the activities for C divide out, and you're left with activity for A and activity for C, oh, sorry, activity for B and activity for A. There we go. Which is exactly the same thing you would have gotten if C weren't there. The presence of C doesn't change the, rea the reaction quotient, doesn't change the equilibrium constant. This has to be true at equilibrium, right? Where Q is equal to K, so it doesn't change the equilibrium constant. It's the same. I don't know why I got C's in there. But anyway, it's the same as if the reaction didn't have the C's at all. It was just A goes to B. Likewise, let's suppose you're calculating the standard state delta G for a reaction. That's products minus reactants weighted by stoichiometric co coefficients, right? 
the products would be the delta G caused by all the reactants except the catalyst. Let's break the catalyst out. We're going to put the catalyst in there, but we're going to break it out, cluster everything else together over in this term. That would, let's call that delta G04 C for the catalyst. On the product side, same thing. We cluster everything together, all the delta G do just to the products that are not C, and then break out the one part that's due to C. Well, you can see that the contributions due to C cancel because of the minus sign here. And so in the end, you get delta G of reaction without the C in there. You just get delta G with all the contributions from the normal reactants and products. In this case, for A goes to B alone without the C present. And you can go through a whole bunch of other examples like that, but the bottom line is the catalysts affect rates, but they don't affect the thermodynamics at all. The delta Gs are unchanged, the equilibrium constants are unchanged, and that means that at equilibrium, all the equilibrium concentrations are unchanged. The reaction goes to equilibrium exactly as it would without the catalyst, it just goes there faster, it just moves faster, and that's the only effect of a catalyst. How do catalysts work? Well, in detail, there's a lot of different ways that they work. But with, I can't think of any exceptions to this right now. I think with all, in all cases, the way that they work is that, some, I mean, a lot of reactions have very complex mechanisms, and so it's hard to pick out exactly where the, rea where the activation barrier in question that's really relevant happens. There's a rate limiting step maybe someplace and it's the activation barrier for that one rate limiting step that the catalyst affects, and it doesn't do anything to all the other steps. There may be 10,000 other steps, but it doesn't do anything to them. It just affects that one activation barrier. That can make it hard to pick out exactly where the catalyst is having its effect, but somewhere it's lowering the activation barrier, which means that <clears throat> before, without the catalyst, the reaction energy diagram looked like this. There was a transition state here and a barrier that's this high. Add the catalyst, and what happens? Suddenly the barrier is lower. Now the barrier is only this high. With a lower activation barrier, the reaction goes a lot faster, right? Because it's up in the exponential. We'll do a calculation down further, a little bit further down, to see how big that effect is. But because these activation energies are up in exponentials, relatively small changes in the barrier height have a big effect on the rate of reaction. And in fact, catalysts oftentimes have an enormous effect on the rate of reaction. It's not a factor of two. It's not a factor of 1.5 or something. It's a factor of a million sometimes or even more. Also, from this diagram, you can see that if the barrier is lower on the, on the, pro on the forward direction side, it's also lower on the, rea the reverse reaction side, right? We lowered the barrier by this much on this side, we lowered it by that same amount on the other side. So it la lowers the barrier for both directions. If the reaction goes this way 10 times faster, it goes backwards 10 times faster too. And that's why the, well, one way you can see why catalysts don't change the position of the equilibrium, right? You are just speeding up both directions at once. And so, yeah, so lowers the energy of activation in both directions and lowers it by the same amount for both directions. And yes, all right, so let me, I'm gonna skip down a little bit here. What is the effect on the rate constant of lowering the barrier. Well, let's look at Arrhenius theory. So here's an, our expression, our Arrhenius expression for the rate constant. There's the pre-exponential factor. There's the exponential factor. Without the catalyst, the energy of activation, let's say, is Ea for the forward direction. But with the catalyst, we have an extra term that's, that lowers the barrier a little bit. It's a negative term, right? We subtract off a, an amount delta Ea on the forward side. <clears throat> what effect does that have on K cat here, on, the, on K for the catalyzed case? Well, using the properties of exponentials, we can factor out this term, 
and we get this. We get a e to the e a f over r t times e to the minus delta e a over r t. This is the normal rate constant, the normal Arrhenius expression for the rate constant without a catalyst. And the effect of the catalyst then is to multiply the old rate constant, this much, by a new factor which depends on how big the change in the height of the barrier was. Let's do a calculation, and in, it's also true in the reverse direction. If you go through the same algebra as up here, you get the same result. Here's the old reverse rate constant, here's the new factor, and notice that this is the same thing as this. So this is, we call the, I call, I call this alpha, it's the same alpha down here in both the forward and the reverse direction. So we're just speeding things up in both directions by 10x, let's say, but it's always the same amount in both directions. All right, so let's do an example then. A catalyst lowers the activation barrier by 20 kilojoules per mole. By what factor alpha is the rate constant increased? And let's suppose that we're near 300 Kelvin because it does depend on what the temperature is. Well, we saw above that the catalyzed rate constant is the uncatalyzed rate constant times this factor, e to the minus delta Ea over Rt. Delta Ea, it says here, is 20 kilojoules per mole, so we put 20,000 in there. We're near Rt, so it's good enough to put Rt is equal to, or we're near 300K, so we'll put 2,500 as the, um, as the value for Rt. Notice that there's no minus sign. It's a plus sign here. It's a plus sign here. So we get, so this is 8, right? 20,000 divided by 2,500 is 8. We have e to the 8th. e to the 8th is around 3,000, and that means that the catalyzed rate constant is 3,000 times faster than the uncatalyzed rate constant. That means that if the uncatalyzed rate constant is so slow as to be negligible, say, if we're in a biological pathway, basically the pathway is off. Now you put the catalyst in, and it's 3,000 times bigger, suddenly it's full on. 3,000, a factor of 3,000 enough, is enough, easily enough, to turn something from basically full off to something roaring full on. And this 20,000 kilojoules per mole, that's a pretty small change. Barrier heights are often 100 kilojoules per mole or more, so this is only about a, in that case, this would be only be about a 20% change in the height of the barrier. And so relatively modest barrier changes can cause large changes in the rate constant. And as I said earlier up above, that enzymes can easily, enzyme catalysts and other catalysts too, can easily cause increases of a million or even more in the rate of reaction. All right, we will stop there.